A cold case team armed with cadaver dogs picks up a scent in the search for Paige Rankowski, missing since 1990. I mean, somebody knows something, right. and somebody needs to say something. Paige Marie Rankowski was born on February 2nd, 1960, to Carl and Ardis Rankowski. Paige was the second of four daughters and spent her early childhood in Hanslet, Michigan. When Paige was in middle school, the family moved to Okemos, the very place she vanished 32 years ago. Her mother described her as the family clown as she was always able to make people laugh. As a teen, she participated in modeling, but understood that what she really wanted to do was work with children. She earned an associate's degree in early childhood education and worked as a substitute teacher at the Educational Child Care Center in Lansing. In the year of 1988, Paige met a man by the name of Steve and knew instantly that he was the man she would spend the rest of her life with. The two got engaged in early 1990 and Paige moved in with her soon-to-be husband around the same time. The couple decided to have their wedding in November of that same year. On May 24, 1990, the Thursday before Memorial Day weekend, Paige had dropped her mother off at the Detroit Metropolitan Airport. She left her mother at the airport around 11.30 a.m. and made a stop to visit a friend in Canton, Michigan. The friend confirmed that the two of them spent the afternoon at the Griffin Park and Paige left around 2.20 p.m. to head back home. Before heading straight home, Paige stopped at a liquor store for a beer between 2.30 and 2.45 p.m. She then headed westbound on I-96 on her way home. Paige was driving in 1986 Silver Cutlass Calais, which belonged to her mother. Steve, Paige's fiance, was the first to realize that something was wrong. It was strange that Paige hadn't shown up at a softball game that afternoon. There was no sign of her at the home they shared, and when he tried calling her mother's house, no one answered. This was very unusual of Paige, and Steve's worry grew as time passed without any word from his fiance. Finally, he decided to drive to Paige's mother's home, where her car was parked, but the house was dark. He decided to break into the house to see if Paige might be inside, infer that something might have happened to her while she was in the house. She was not there. No one was there, but the answering machine was blinking. The message was from the Livingston County Sheriff's Department. At about 6 p.m. near Fowlerville Exit 129, police found the cutlass with its lights on, the keys in the ignition, and the car running. The driver's side door was closed, but unlocked, while the passenger's door was closed and locked. Paige's purse and shoes were in the car. Assuming the car had been abandoned, they had it towed to the Sheriff's Department property yard and were calling to let artist Paige's mother know that it was there for her to pick up. The car was discovered by a man driving down I-96 who saw the car pulled over on the shoulder around 3.30 p.m. He didn't think anything of it until he drove through the area again at 8 p.m. and saw that the car hadn't moved. Concerned, he decided to call police to let them know about the seemingly abundant vehicle. Hearing this, Steve realized that Paige had driven her mother's car to the airport. He was certain that his fiance would never willingly abandon the car. He made a phone call to Ardis to tell her what was going on and reported Paige missing immediately after. Paige's mother immediately returned to Okemos, determined to find Paige. Once Paige was reported missing, investigators realized that the car was a potential crime scene and went to the property yard to secure the car. Detectives assumed that something or someone made Paige pull over onto the side of the road. There was nothing mechanically wrong with the car and it was in perfect working order. Gas was in the car and there were no dents or marks on the car to suggest that it had been in any kind of accident. Investigators started their investigation by scouring the road near where Paige's car had been abandoned, but found nothing to indicate that any sort of struggle had taken place. Detectives didn't believe that Paige or any other woman would intentionally walk away from the car without taking her shoes and purse with her, but weren't able to find any foul play. It was as if Paige had simply fallen into a black hole and disappeared without a trace. Artis, her mother, was determined to find her daughter alive, 
and her home was turned into a makeshift command center for the search of Paige. Thousands of missing flyers were printed and distributed throughout the area. The family knew that traffic on I-96 had been heavy that Thursday due to the upcoming holiday weekend and made several public appeals for drivers who might have seen something and urging them to contact police with any information. Almost a dozen people called police reporting that they had seen Paige standing near her car on I-96 around 3.15 p.m. that Thursday. They also reported that a dark red or maroon minivan was pulled in behind Paige and she was talking to a black male, 20 to 30 years of age, who appeared to be the driver of the van. The man was described as well-groomed, of medium build, and about six feet tall. Some of the witnesses believed that there had been a second male inside the van, but weren't able to give further description of the second male. None of the witnesses saw any kind of struggle between Paige and this man, or saw her getting into the van. During the course of the investigation, even more reports came in from motorists, who believed that they had seen Paige that day. One person claimed that they had seen Paige speeding down I-96 while another car appeared to be following her, while another claimed he saw her on the side of the road talking to a man who was leading her by her elbow towards his vehicle. Another person believed he saw Paige throwing her arms up in the air while talking to a man who then put his hand on her shoulder. None of these reports could be confirmed. Paige's disappearance left Steve restless, so instead of staying at home waiting for Paige to be found, him and several of his friends spent hours parked along the side of I-96, writing down the license plate of every dark red or maroon minivan that drove past them. They gave their findings to detectives, who followed up on each van, but were unable to connect any of them to Paige's disappearance. The Tuesday following Paige's disappearance, nine teams of tracking dogs combed through a 500-acre area surrounding the spot where her car had been found while a police helicopter scanned the area from above. Nothing came of the search. This news took a toll on Paige's family and friends. Her father, Carl, suffered a seizure and had to be hospitalized, while another close friend fainted. Dozens of people who didn't know the family would call in at Artis's home to volunteer to help distribute posters, and by the end of the week, Paige's face could be seen throughout Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Minnesota. The family announced that they were offering a $6,000 reward for information leading to the safe return of Paige, and tips came flooding in. A total of 12 different agencies, including the FBI, were involved in the investigation. During the first week, they followed up on more than 300 potential leads. Still, with all this action, nothing led to Paige. In an effort to keep the case alive, a Lansing advertisement company donated 20 billboards so that Paige's missing poster could be displayed along major highways. The increased publicity brought dozens of tips, but none of them helped to find Paige. After a year of Paige's disappearance, her family held a news conference to remind the public that they were still looking for the missing woman. Over the past 12 months, a 20-person task force had followed up on more than 700 leads but had been unable to make any progress in determining what had happened to Paige. In May of 1999, a task force called New Hope was created to take a fresh look at high-profile cold cases in Livingston County, and Paige's disappearance was at the top of their list. Almost immediately, the task force received several new tips about the case. Although they refused to provide specific details, investigators stated that the new information indicated that Paige had been murdered. The cold case team started the process of reinvestigating each of the nearly 1,000 tips that had been received over the years, looking for anything that might have been missed or overlooked during the first investigation. In May 2001, they announced that they had a suspect in the case, but released no information about him other than he was currently in jail on unrelated charges. In June 2002, investigators announced the man was still considered a suspect, but they did not have enough information to make an arrest. In 2009, detectives announced that they now believe Paige was last seen 
on the side of I-96 around 4.10 p.m., not before 3.30 p.m., as they had previously indicated. They told reporters that they had a list of six potential suspects. One of them had been murdered in Detroit in 1999. They did not release his name, but noted that he did not once have a burgundy minivan, similar to the one witnesses reported seeing on the day Paige disappeared. Six months after Paige's disappearance, investigators received a letter with a map enclosed in it. The map indicated where Paige's body was buried in the Sober Road area of Conway Township. In May 2011, investigators began using ground-penetrating radar at one of the sites where they believed Paige might be buried. The search turned up empty. Over the next several months, they continued to investigate possible burial sites determined to finally bring Paige home. Using cadaver dogs, they believed that they had identified a possible location in November 2011 in Fowlerville. Investigators were confident that this might be the place where they might finally find Paige. They began digging on November 18, 2011. Well, Joanne, this all started digging around 10.30 this morning and it's all happened. Road. And what we're told by the sheriff is that they are scraping layer by layer of the dirt here. Cadaver dogs hit on this area in four spots last week during a search. And these are dogs that only hit on human remains. They hit on four spots. Those four areas that they're searching are all within 35 yards of each other. And you're seeing video of the search right now. And there were searches done in the past here along Sober Road, all because of a map that was given to the Sheriff's Department within 30 days of Paige's disappearance. And the dig yielded absolutely nothing. Everyone was certain that this would have been the time they would have finally found out what happened to Paige. As of today, the case remains cold and detectives are still waiting for someone to contact them with the information they need to finally bring closure to this case. Investigators believe that there is definitely someone out there who knows exactly what happened to Paige Rinkowski. Artist Paige's mother sadly died in 2017 the Pages' sisters and other family members are still actively searching for answers.